Okay, good afternoon. Uh, it's great to see everybody here, and I know we're webcasting online. My name is Josh Sharfstein. I am the Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement here at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I am Director of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, one of the sponsors of um, to today's talk, um, and it is going to be great. Um, I am very pleased that Dr. Patrick is here with us. Um, Stephen Patrick is a neonatologist. He's an associate professor of pediatrics and the uh, director of the Vanderbilt Center for Child Health Policy. And um, he is, uh, I'll say that um, it's not uncommon for pediatricians to be very involved in, in health policy. It is somewhat uncommon for neonatologists to be within pediatrics to be very involved in child health policy. Um, neonatologists are, um, uh, there's an enormous amount of technical expertise that goes into being a neonatologist and taking care of babies that, you know, can be under 500 grams at the time of birth um, clinically. Um, but being a neonatologist also involves very intense interactions with parents and uh, around their kids at some of the most vulnerable and difficult times in their lives. So right there you have two major sets of skills a good neonatologist has. And then to be able to conceptualize and think about um, the overall social and policy context for the work is um, really a triple, triple set of tools. And Dr. Patrick definitely has them all. He has been um, a national leader, particularly on the opioid epidemic, writing and doing research on critical aspects of policy as it relates to um, uh, uh, babies particularly, but also um, pregnancy. Um, and I think um, today's talk is going to be tremendous because he's going to talk not just about the science, which, you know, a good neonatologist should be pretty comfortable with on neonatal absence syndrome in 2019 in the United States, but also um, the politics and putting those two things together, I can't think of anyone better really um, in the country to be talking to us uh, at this critical time. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Patrick. Oh, it's really an honor to be here uh, to talk today uh, about some of the work that we do and talk about this issue that, uh, that, that we care uh, so much about. And thanks for such a generous introduction as well. Um, it was a good sort of endorsement of why being an immunologist is an awesome job. I have no conflicts of interest uh, to disclose. You know, this is the, as Josh was just talking about, the context for when I was, how I was exposed to the opioid crisis. It was with infants in the neonatal ICU having opioid withdrawal. And they are just different. They appear different than most of the babies that we take care of who are born very preterm or with complex birth defects. These infants tend to be fussy. They tend to be bigger. They tend to be irritable. And so they really catch your eye. That really started our journey in trying to understand how the opioid crisis was affecting pregnant women and infants. What I want to talk about today is some of the broader context. We are going to del delve into some of the science behind this, talk a little bit about neonatal absence syndrome, but around public perceptions and around policy and how public perception drives policy. You know, last week I was rounding in the unit, and uh, one thing that became apparent, there's another, another epidemic that is driving uh, adverse events for both pregnant women and infants uh, that doesn't get a lot of attention. In fact, is framed very differently, and that's diabetes. Uh, so here's an example of some press around an infant uh, born uh, that was clearly an infant of a diabetic mother, even though it doesn't actually say it in the USA Today article. Mom gives birth to a 15-pound miracle baby. Uh, and you can, see, you can see the baby. It looks like a linebacker uh, in terms of the babies that we typically take care of, but was in the ICU for you know, breathing issues and monitoring blood sugar. I mean, you can look at the baby and see is on a little extra respiratory support there, has a central line going into the umbilical cord. Uh, in the last two years, I've, in the last year, I've seen two cases of caudal regression, uh, pretty severe birth uh, complications that happen from uncontrolled diabetes in the first trimester. And you know, we, we don't approach this problem when we think about interacting with moms who have uncontrolled diabetes the same way that we do when we talk about infants who are opioid exposed or substance exposed broadly. Instead, this is what we see. We see born addicted, the number of opioid addicted babies is soaring. 
the language is so different. The framing is so different. And in fact, we'll talk about a little bit later about how even language in state legislation mirrors a lot of this. We see the tragedy of neonatal abstinence syndrome. I don't see the tragedy of infants of a diabetic mother. And that's kind of the context that we're going to talk about today, because I think it permeates the stigma around substance use disorder broadly and in pregnancy that impedes the ability of people to get into treatment. So we're going to talk about substance use in pregnancy, neonatal abstinence syndrome. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're doing care delivery a little bit different at Vanderbilt. I'm going to delve into long-term outcomes, and then we're going to close with some policy changes and some recent both federal and state policy, and then we'll have time for questions. I'd like to start here. This is from the transactions of the Medical Society of the State of Tennessee. It's from Knoxville in, uh, in 1892. And this was a case series of pregnant women who used opium in pregnancy. And they describe was a pretty classic case of uh, opioid withdrawal. They describe an infant who was fussy and nervous. Uh, this infant ultimately died, which was the natural course, natural course for opioid exposed infants around that time. They do describe treatment of opioid withdrawal in newborns. And I know I see, I know there's some clinicians here too. Any idea of how we cared for opioid exposed infants in Tennessee in 1890? Feel free to yell it out. Opioids, opioids plus one other substance. Yes, thank you, Ed. Opium and whiskey was the treatment of, co of, treatment of, uh, of choice uh, around that time uh, in this case series. And look, I'm not gonna delve a lot into the history of the opioid crisis to leave a space for other, and because you all are experts on the opioid crisis, but we know we've had multiple ways, waves of opioid crises in the past in the United States. This one has been different. And this is what's changed broadly, and this is the context that our moms and babies find themselves in. What as CDC is described as three waves, some people will talk about uh, a layered cake because we still see multiple different, uh, multiple different exposures, first starting with the rise of prescription opioid deaths, then heroin, and now fentanyl that in so many communities uh, is killing so many people. Well, let's talk about substance use and pregnancy more broadly. And I think one of the things that strikes me in this space is the hyper focus on opioids. Um, and for any of us who are in the, in the unit uh, taking care of babies, taking care of moms, we know that you know, one substance use uh, is not only uncommon, but also it, opioids may not be the most important exposure to begin with, or even the most frequent. Illicit substance use in pregnancy is not that uncommon. Overall, about 8.5% of pregnant women use some illicit substance in pregnancy. That is notably much lower than the general population. Pregnancy is a time where people make changes and having access to treatment is so critical for all substance use disorder. We see too that legal drugs are very common. 15% of pregnant women still smoke cigarettes, about one in 10 still drink alcohol. And we know that alcohol is the number one preventable cause of developmental delay in children. So a pretty striking amount when we think about this and oftentimes, we hear so much focus on opioids that we, we miss this. And in part, it's because it has that sensationalized view at the very beginning, where we see a baby going through withdrawal. Sometimes you'll see videos that are uncharacteristic of what withdrawal actually looks like, and we catch it. Alcohol use can be silent. For pregnant women that are younger, these rates tend to be much higher. Uh, so about one in, one in five smoke cigarettes and a much higher rate of alcohol use and particularly binge drinking. Almost 7% of young pregnant women do binge drinking. It's important in any talk about neonatal absence syndrome to talk about treatment, why we do treatment, why it's important, and what the barriers to treatment are. The science around treatment isn't subtle. Uh, if I went into our neonatal ICU and said, I've got a therapy that's gonna reduce risk of death by 50%, nobody would bat an eye. And yet we still have many people who can't get treatment in the US and we're gonna talk about that. The two main substances used in pregnancy are buprenorphine and methadone. And um, what I, when I describe to folks what this is like, imagine you are uh, injecting heroin and you have these cycles of intoxication and withdrawal, intoxication and withdrawal. Of course that's stressful on the mom in terms of her, issue, her risk of relapse and overdose, but for the, for the developing fetus, it also results in a low birth weight, a lot of fetal distress, and risk of preterm birth. We know that buprenorphine and methadone, they stabilize that. And we know that pregnant women have decreased risk of overdose death, relapse, hepatitis C, and HIV. And for infants, there's, there's a benefit too. They are more likely to go to term and have higher birth weights, but there is risk of drug withdrawal. What I see oftentimes in terms of what's missed 
particularly in political conversations around this, is why we do medications for opioid use disorder to begin with. Um, so we look at the infant who has withdrawal. We talk about, oh, we want to prevent the infant having withdrawal. What happens is that we're preventing that infant is born at 25 weeks or 24 weeks that is opioid exposed and their mom couldn't get into treatment. Those babies don't have withdrawal. They're too immature. We don't know the exact reasons why, but they don't have withdrawal. We're trading off that very preterm opioid exposed infant for an infant with withdrawal, and that's a good trade. We'll talk about long-term outcomes in a little bit, but we know the complications that 25-weekers have, the much more severe than, the, than infants that are, uh, that are born having opioid withdrawal. This is an email I got not that long ago from a community pediatrician in Nashville. Um, she was taking care of an infant who was opioid exposed. Mom was on medications for a medication for opioid use disorder, Suboxone's a brand name. Infant didn't have uh, uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome. Can I think of any resources to get her her medications? Which is striking because someone paid for the delivery, right? So we have someone who got was able to get into medical care, but they can't get access to medications for opioid use disorder. And why is that? So this, and as well as some other things, led us to ask the question, do pregnant women have a harder time getting into treatment? Why is that? What are some of the barriers that are there? And we just, I'm gonna share with you some preliminary data uh, that we've done uh, looking at some barriers to access to treatment. So we did a randomized uh, field experiment, a secret shopper experiment, where we had trained uh, actors, um, pregnant women, non-pregnant women, trying to get treatment in 10 states. So to, to simulate what was real life, we used the SAMHSA treatment locator, which if any of you know the SAMHSA treatment locator, at this point we all know it's not so great in terms of being accurate, but I'm gonna show you how inaccurate it is. So we had more than 10,000 scheduling attempts to, to get into pro, of like pregnant woman, non-pregnant woman trying to get into treatment. 7,000 times we couldn't reach our provider. And we called at least five times every provider. 3,400 3, times we did reach a provider. And of providers we were able to reach we see a big difference in terms of pregnant women being able to get into treatment. Uh, and this is just the overall. There is a, there's about a 12 percentage point difference between the two. But this varied substantially from state to state. So if we look overall, again, you see the differences here. If we look at, again, getting in, you see uh, Kentucky has a low of about 50 percent uh, and a big difference between pregnant women and non-pregnant women. And then you see some other states like Virginia where that difference doesn't appear to be quite as much. We called both buprenorphine providers. These are outpatient docs, generally, that are wavered to prescribe buprenorphine. We also called opioid treatment programs. These are methadone clinics. And you can see the acceptance rate is much, much higher in opioid treatment programs. But of course, most of the expansion we've seen in terms of, of getting uh, treatment to, to women into, into communities has been for, for outpatient buprenorphine providers. We know, for example, in West Virginia, one of the, the state that is arguably the hardest hit year after year, it's my home state, uh, only nine OTPs uh, were unique in, the time, in our study period. If we dig a little bit deeper about how people were able to get into treatment, oftentimes it's because they were willing to pay cash. The way we called, we, were, we had the same vignette, uh, except for one was a 16-week pregnant woman, one wasn't. And the next step was they had insurance, and we had local community uh, market. So we knew when we were calling a county in like Davidson County, Tennessee, we knew the number one, both Medicaid managed care plans as well as private plans. So they had the common forms of insurance. We find that frequently, only about, about, about a quarter of people that were able to get into treatment were able to get into treatment because they would pay cash. And if you look again here, look at Florida, look at Tennessee, very low acceptance of any insurance. And it's not just against Medicaid, it's any insurance, cash pay. We found that around the average, the median, uh, excuse me, median uh, amount of out-of-pocket costs for the first appointment was around $250. OTPs were very different in terms of, uh, a, a bit more in terms of accepting any type of insurance. Well, let's talk about neonatal abstinence syndrome, transitioning that sort of broad context of where we are in terms of the opioid crisis, then access to, to treatment for pregnant women. Now talking a little bit about how I was initially introduced to the crisis, and that's through uh, infants. The neonatal abstinence syndrome is a drug withdrawal syndrome that some infants who are exposed to opioids develop. It generally follows an opioid exposure. And if you look at many federal agencies now, they're calling it neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. In the literature, we see other substances implicated, like alcohol, benzodiazepines, which do have their own withdrawal syndrome, and barbiturates. The literature suggests around 40 to 80% of infants who are exposed to methadone or heroin develop withdrawal. From some of our work for prescription opioids, drugs like Vicodin, it appears to be much lower. 
So the common clinical signs for neonatal abstinence syndrome are, uh, are the things that we, when we think about where opioid receptors live. So common GI signs are poor feeding, vomiting, and loose stools. Uh, not uncommon to see a lot of weight loss very early. Newborns lose about 10% of their, of their weight uh, and, and gain it back around the, uh, ideally about two weeks of life. I've seen some infants lose 10% of their body weight in two days um, from having severe withdrawal. Um, CNS signs, tremors, irritability, and some autonomic signs too. But how do we make the diagnosis? This is one of the most challenging things in our field, and this is how we do it. Uh, this was the sc scoring tools that were developed before I was born. We know that not every uh, opioid-exposed infant uh, develops withdrawal. We, it is helpful to have a history. Um, so withdrawal is really only dangerous when we, we don't know that there's been an exposure and withdrawal occurs at home. But the diagnosis is made upon, uh, based, upon, based upon a scoring system. Here's an example of a modification of the original Finnegan score. And look, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not the, the, the smartest person in the world, but I can make some of these diagnoses, right? I can, I can figure out a fever. I think I can figure that one out. But you can see how regurgitation, oh, it's, it's advancing without me. Regurgitation versus projectile uh, vomiting, how subjective some of those things may be. All the tools that we have to diagnose neonatal abstinence syndrome right now haven't been validated. They are very subjective. They have issues with inter rater reliability, and we do have tools and trainings to make this more consistent. But in the United States today, there isn't one way to make a diagnosis of neonatal abstinence syndrome. There's not an agreed upon gold standard, and this leads to a lot of confusion about what exactly we're measuring. So if we look at that tool, other tools, they were developed in the 1970s. That the, the, the Finnegan score was a score was a was a research tool initially, um, and it was primarily in heroin exposed infants when the median length of stay was six days for infants. Um, you know, I think this lack of agreement in terms of what a clinical definition is leads to variability in many things, from research, study to surveillance. Um, there isn't a, an agreed upon treatment protocol either. We can talk about medications to use, but you can't go into one hospital and say, hey, this is the gold standard, this is exactly what you should be doing, because there isn't any evidence to drive that. So we see, again, variability, and I'm gonna show you some hospital billing data in terms of looking at the national trend of the neonatal abstinence syndrome, but there's likely some variability in that too, because there is an agreement upon what we're measuring. So here's what's happened with neonatal abstinence syndrome. This is, this is looking at using hospital billing data to get a sense of what's happening nationally, and this is from a series of studies that we published. On the y-axis here is the rate of neonatal abstinence syndrome for 1,000 hospital births, and on the x-axis is year. And what we've seen is a stark increase in, uh, in rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome. It's about a three-fold, I'm sorry, it's about a seven-fold increase in neonatal abstinence syndrome in the, during the study period. And it looks not that dissimilar to essentially any graph that you look at for the opioid crisis. It mirrors it pretty darn closely. Um, in 20, 2016, about one infant was born every 15 minutes on average having opioid withdrawal. Again, just highlighting the effect that we see in communities and hospitals. Median hospital costs for infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome are about five times higher um, than, uh, than not uncomplicated births. And if we look just over a period of a decade, it's about $2 billion in excess dollars just to Medicaid. About 80% of these infants to 90%, depending upon the community, are, uh, are, uh, are on Medicaid. And why this is important is that in many cases, what we see in our units is we're reacting to a broader opioid crisis in our neonatal ICUs. And state governments are really positioned to think about how do we expand access to treatment. Imagine if we use some of this $2 billion to expand access to treatment for pregnant women. I mean, just look at the, if we did special programs, for example, to, uh, to get, to, to increase uh, acceptance of pregnant women. Um, there's a lot of strategies that I think could be employed that aren't, we're simply just reacting in the neonatal ICU. So how do we treat this? Uh, so first, our, our goal is to um, control treatment and, uh, and to minimize complications after withdrawal. And the, really the gold standard, and we have like the expert here in terms of non-pharmacologic care, is to control the environment, to respond to the infant, to not overstimulate the infant. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing in our space. But for severe withdrawal, it does require an opioid. Uh, opioid for opioid withdrawal is really the standard of care. Uh, this can be morphine, methadone, and more, more recently, buprenorphine as well for infants. We capture the infant's clinical signs and we slowly taper them off um, until, they have, until they're ready to go home. So what do we do in this context of no gold standards, um, lots of variable care? Um, well, there are things that we can do to improve what we're doing just in hospital settings. The first is just doing the same thing every time. Um, the Ohio Perinatal Collaborative, these are perinatal collaboratives that are, that are in various states to try to improve care, primarily for newborns, but now increasingly moms too. They did some work just looking at comparing uh, hospitals that strictly adhered to a treatment protocol versus those who didn't. 
and the length of stay difference was half. We also had about 200 uh, hospitals throughout the United States and parts of Canada that were involved uh, in a, a national collab an international collaborative, by definition, uh, in uh, around 200 centers. And we found, again, in that, that just standardizing what we do every time, hospitals that increasingly protocolized what they did resulted in a decreased length of stay um, and a decreased length of treatment. That was modest if you look at the numbers, like from 21 days to 19 days, but if you look institution-wide or nationwide, North America-wide, I'm having a hard time with, with Canada today, sorry about that, Canadian friends, um, you, you can see the, the, the population-wide impact. We've also seen some other care innovations. We were just talking about how scoring is challenging, and so some colleagues have developed scores called Eat, Sleep, Console, um, and the approach to that is basically, can the infant eat, can they sleep, can they console, then, 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 then they're okay. We see much lower rates of treatment uh, of infants that are treated with this approach one of the problems is, is we see some institutions that are now treating no infants with morphine. What does that mean? I mean, can you imagine being an adult going through withdrawal and someone says, all right, good luck, we're gonna swaddle you. It's, it's a different, it's a very kind of inappropriate, I mean, in, ineffective approach for some infants. You know, not every infant has severe expression of, of withdrawal that needs pharmacotherapy, but likely some do. This is where we've seen things really emerge from quality improvement literature, which is important, but we need some rigorous studies to understand what it means. More recent literature suggests that using a longer acting opioid like morphine or method, like methadone or buprenorphine may also decrease length of stay. But the really, the thing that I think makes the most difference is changing the care model. Um, and let's talk about what, what this has looked like in the United States and we'll talk about what we've done. And honestly, what we've done is really just borrowing from what some institutions have done for years, like Hopkins, like folks in Vancouver and beyond. So here's what the traditional model of care is like. We have an opioid exposed infant born in a rural area in Tennessee, for example, and we feel the need to transfer them to a tertiary care facility that separates mom and baby, and we place the baby in a NICU somewhere. Treatment is often separate from the mom. The mom's not engaged in the treatment at all, and it's oftentimes excluded. Breastfeeding is not allowed, uh, or at least inconsistent. We focus a lot on the correct medicine. Are we giving morphine? Are we giving methadone as opposed to the care process? Burnout is common uh, among, among our nursing staff. There's good literature to support that. Uh, trauma and care, uh, trauma-informed care approaches are, are uncommon. Care is oftentimes not standardized. And length of stay in the literature for infants that, have, uh, that are exposed to opioids extends to 100, 120 days in the hospital, weaning on opioids. And withdrawal doesn't last that long in any other population. So what's different now? Emerging models are engaging mom, keeping mom and baby together. Transfer to a tertiary care facility may not be necessary. Um, keeping the diet intact and out of the ICU when possible. I mean, I don't know how many of you have been in the neonatal ICU, but the classic model is an open bay model where you might have an infant going through withdrawal, very sensitive to sound and light, next to an infant on heart-lung bypass or on a ventilator. Treatment's inclusive of the mom. How do we include mom and even the assessments that we do for infants uh, in terms of you know, engaging them in the scoring of infants and the treatment? Breastfeeding is supported and encouraged. There are guidelines, there are consensus guidelines, but guidelines on when women should breastfeed. Focusing on the care process, how we're delivering care. I mean, really the model that we've had in the past, it's the care process that has really exacerbated the clinical signs that have led to withdrawal. Engaging the staff in trauma-informed care using standardized protocols, and really this, is this has resulted in, a, at least for us, a large reduction in length of stay, as well as uh, much happier families. So what we developed with some funding from a local foundation was something we call Team Hope. And um, we know that the care, that, that in terms of like the care that's delivered, I'm probably the least important person that's there. Um, engaging our nursing staff, our social workers, child life, lactation consultant, that's really the important piece. What we had before was, uh, was a lack of standardization of protocols too. We might have a woman who's treated in our prenatal clinic that's told, sure, you can breastfeed, you've been, you've been adhering to therapy. Then in the newborn nurse, she told something else. Then they go to the NICU, oh no, you can't breastfeed. Then in our general inpatient ward, something completely different. So that's also part of what we've done. So we formed uh, about two years ago now, a little more than two years ago, and since we formed, we've had around 267 infants who met our inclusion criteria. And for this, it's just that you're greater than 35 weeks and you don't have to go to the NICU for another reason, like respiratory distress. We've diagnosed about a quarter with neonatal absence syndrome. Uh, and this is, we were talking about how variable the definition is. This is a clinician saying, looks like, looks like you got withdrawal. Um, but you, we've seen this drop over time as we've had more inclusive care with mom. About 20% have re really received one dose, at least, of morphine, and we've had three readmissions in the time within seven days, really not related to neonatal absence syndrome. 
what we've seen is that we've engaged child life specialists. We were able to have the resources to have one a child life specialist who is uh, engages with families about how to, and, and siblings, how do you engage with your infant? How can you be part of the team? And really as an advocate in L&D as well. Lactation consultant, we have about 65% of our parents that are, uh, that are eligible to breastfeed, and most of them are. I mean, many women have history of sexual trauma, breastfeeding is complicated, but many of them are providing breast milk in the form of, of pumping. Um, uh, and I think it's uh, em empowering. This is really the shift that we've had. 61% of our infants are discharged from the newborn nursery, 37 from our general inpatient ward, 2% from our NICU. This is fundamentally different than what we were before. We have a 100-bed NICU, and about 10% of our infants were, uh, were uh, having withdrawal in our NICU before. We're keeping them in the hospital not as long. We're providing better care at a lower cost, and it's really kind of the quadruple aim overall. Overall, we, we, our length of stay is five days. We, we observe all ex opioid-exposed infants for three to seven days to see if they develop withdrawal, 12 days if you get a diagnosis of NAS. We were 21 days before. So what we've really been focusing on is this transition. So once we, so we've worked to decrease the, um, the length of stay that we've had in the hospital, but, but what does that mean when you go home? We haven't been thinking about that. We've focused so much on quality improvement. It's not like you go to a mom in L&D and say, let's talk about length of stay. No one cares about length of stay. It's a hospital-driven metric. It's not a family-driven metric. So we've been thinking a lot about how we can have a safe handoff, how we can think about things that happen after discharge. And when we do this, we think about what is the broader context that we're seeing. One of those is hepatitis C. We've seen a dramatic rise in hepatitis C among pregnant women. Um, and uh, from 2009 to 2014, we're updating these data now, we saw a doubling of hepatitis C among pregnant women in the US. In West Virginia, for example, one in 50 babies were exposed to hepatitis C in 2014. And that has only continued to rise. And, and why is this important? Well, it's important, one, because there's now a cure for mom if we identify it. It's also not standardized, it's not test, it's not routinely test, uh, tested for pregnant women when they're in L&D. It has implications for the infant. Even though vertical transmission, transmission from mom to baby is, is somewhat infrequent, about 6% in the literature, 11% if there's co-infection with HIV, we do a very poor job of making sure that infants are tested. Hepatitis C is completely silent in infants. You, know, you can't look at an infant in the NICU and say, oh, you've been exposed to hepatitis C. So we have to follow them and test them. Uh, the um, Wisconsin Develop Department of Health uh, found that only 34% of infants uh, developed were actually tested to see if they uh, developed hepatitis C. Uh, they found a similarly low vertical transmission rate of 4%. One of our fellows, now faculty members, just has she has a paper that's uh, that's been accepted to pediatrics. Looking in Tennessee, we looked at 4,000 exposed infants over a 10-year period and found that about 22% were tested, and we found a large racial disparity. Controlling for everything, controlling for, well, not everything. That's kind of a I mean, a school of public health. I shouldn't say controlling for everything, but for controlling for a lot of structural factors, controlling for we find that there's a persistent um, pers persistent disparity that uh, black infants are 60% less likely to be tested when compared to white infants uh, for reasons that are, that are not clear other than um, structural racism. So what does optimal di discar discharge look like? So we as a group thought about how do we make this better? Um, it does start in the hospital. I mean, traditionally, again, we have a, a separation of mom and baby. What about that bond early in the hospital? So promoting breastfeeding, engaging the family, assessing the family's needs and follow-up, uh, including mom's needs for mental health treatment for infectious disease evaluations. It also considers the post-discharge need, things like home nurse visitation, child welfare involvement in positive ways we can, IDA Part C, which is early intervention, this sort of zero to three developmental needs for infants, more frequent pediatrician follow-up, and coordinating um, with maternal treatment. So we have a pretty engaged group of people. We're just talking about all the folks that are around. So we wondered how often were we doing this consistently? The answer was not at all. 2% of the time we did this every time for, for kids. Did we make an appointment for a pediatrician? Did we refer to early intervention? Did we make a referral for hepatitis C if there was exposure? Uh, we were doing it 2% of the time consistently. So we, this is part of our quality improvement work where we just discussed, hey, we're not very good at this. Uh, and then increased over time. We created some simple checklists and with, uh, within our EMR and did some education and we got better. And then of course we lost a social worker and that hurt. Um, and so we, we published some of this in, in some of the quality improvement literature this summer. Uh, we're now consistently in the 90% range, which is, you know, it still has some room to grow. But again, we've really focused in on how do we improve hospital care. And this is not a perfect solution for thinking about discharge, but at least it's a step in the right direction in terms of thinking about how we can connect. I want to transition a little bit to thinking about communities and how communities 
matter. And I'm going to start with a couple pictures of the town where I was born in southern West Virginia. I visited there just about a month ago. And these are some pictures of, of downtown Bluefield. And uh, while there is a Corvette there, um, you can see what some of the buildings look like. And this is on a Friday afternoon. This is not like, uh, you know, 2 a.m. This is a Friday afternoon in terms of what we've seen. Uh, my hometown uh, has seen a population loss of about half since 1950. About 10,000 people live there now. Uh, has a higher over opioid overdose rate uh, than other parts uh, than than the other parts of the of the country. 3.5% of the infants born in this in this county uh, are diagnosed with drug withdrawal. And if you look, I mean, many of you are probably very familiar with the uh, case in uh, uh, case in Deaton work, uh, looking at communities. Trying to understand uh, their work, trying to understand what community level factors, be that long term, lack of job, economic opportunity, the change of social fabric, the change of churches and communities, how that may be leading to the opioid crisis. And we wanted to ask the same thing. What, what's happening in communities that may be leading to uh, increased rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome throughout the, throughout the country? So to do that, we focused on eight states. Um, and we picked them just for variability in terms of both policies as well as um, as well as um, uh, uh, how bad the opioid crisis was in those communities. I'm gonna focus in on three states around where I am in Appalachia, and I'm just gonna show you some descriptive data first. So this is, uh, this is a map, obviously, of Kentucky, North Carolina, uh, and uh, Tennessee. And the darker the blue, uh, the more intense the rate of neonatal abstinence syndrome. And here's what we've experienced over time. You can see a couple of things. First off, it's spreading just like you would expect an epidemic to spread. This looks like any opioid-related complication in this area. You also see that disproportionately Appalachian communities have been affected. Rural, remote communities have been affected. But we wanted to look at what was happening in those communities. What was the effect, for example, of long-term unemployment? So we looked at a 10-year moving average in these communities to understand, you know, it's not just about what the employment rate is today, but what's it been for the last decade? So when we overlap, just looking at those communi same communities, here you see the combination of the two. In the dark purple are the communities that have high rates of both unemployment and neonatal abstinence syndrome, long-term unemployment. And you see them pop out again in parts of Appalachia. But you also see counties where that's not the case. Counties that have high rates of unemployment that don't have high rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome. It's interesting to think about what that looks like. <laughs> Excuse me. When we look at these data in total, for a 10-year period, we found that unemployment rate, long-term unemployment rate, rose to about 8.5%. This is, of course, during the period of the Great Recession as well. We found that, uh, it, was high, that it, uh, it was also associated with higher rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome, particularly in remote rural communities. So about a two percentage point increase in long-term unemployment in remote, ru remote rural communities, adjusting for other factors, was associated with a 34% higher rate of neonatal abstinence syndrome. We also wanted to understand what was happening in terms of access to mental health treatment. And uh, here the descriptive data are striking themselves. In urban communities, 80% of communities were either partial or full uh, mental health shortage areas. In rural communities, it's 90%. So that lack of heterogeneity, because it's so bad everywhere, limits our ability to really be definitive about these findings. Oh, but we did find that shortage of mental health areas were also associated with higher rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome, about 17%. We know that untreated mental health uh, conditions uh, is associated with, uh, with, with uh, substance use disorder. You can look at these data on our website. It's childpolicy.org. We get really geeked about this uh, our shiny tool. Um, so you can see that. You can look at counts by, uh, by, by community. You can play with the data, too. You can make, it, you know, make the unemployment rate better, worse. Um, we're pretty geeked about this. Uh, I'm talking fast. Sorry about that. Um, even for somebody, for somebody from Tennessee, I'm talking really fast, right? For like someone here, I'm not talking so fast. So as we think about the next things, I want to talk about uh, the framing in terms of long-term outcomes, the way we view this, and, and how some of this, I think, also influences policy decisions that are made at the state level. And the first thing I want to talk about is the difference we see in coverage of the cocaine epidemic from a few years ago to now. This is obviously a cover of the... Um, the Time Magazine, where we see crack kids that disproportionately affected minority communities, and this was the messaging. We've got a lost generation of kids that are happening. And we found this not to be true, but the stigma, the way we approach this, permeated not only the medical literature, but in how state laws were crafted. 
And let's contrast this to what we, what we see in terms of the opioid crisis. This is from the New York Times, children of the opioid epidemic. And we see a really nice, beautiful picture of a white child. It's very different in the way we've approached it. And yes, science has advanced in the way we know about addiction, but there's no question the role of racism in policies and the way we, we did work um, in, the last, in, the last, in the last year. So maternal drug use doesn't occur in isolation. And this is why some of the long-term outcomes is really pretty confounded. We know that um, it often occurs with poor health, poor nutrition, food insecurity, uh, poor prenatal care, social stress, partner, intimate partner violence is very common. Each of those can be associated with poor obstetric outcomes. Each factor could, have, could, uh, could affect neurodevelopment outcomes as well. And here's the other question that, that oftentimes gets unaddressed. It's the issue of alcohol. We talked about that at the very beginning. It is very difficult to disentangle the effect of alcohol versus other substances, um, short of a very rigorous prospective study. Alcohol is frequently under-recognized. When I first started my, uh, my, my time at Vanderbilt, one of the first things I did was like, oh, well, let's look at alcohol data, both in like we had some, it was on the birth certificate in Tennessee for a while, we were also collecting in the unit, and it turns out there was only three alcohol-exposed infants in the state. We, we don't recognize it uh, very well. Prenatal alcohol use, again, is the, is the chief, develop, chief cause of developmental delay in kids. Um, it's frequently underappreciated. And we found from some of our work, just looking at the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, of pregnant women who misuse opioids uh, in the last year, about 33% use alcohol in the last month. Um, so we don't capture that. How does that affect some of the long-term outcome literature? Next, the role of trauma and, tra and toxic stress. Uh, we learn more and more about this, but trauma is exceedingly common for women with substance use disorder. About three quarters report some type of sexual abuse emotional abuse, about half physical abuse. It's exceedingly common, and we under-recognize it. It's not part of our conversations in NICUs. It's not part of uh, how we think about the context for uh, both policy as well as our studies. Adverse child experiences are ex exceedingly common. And just a couple, you know, this is all retrospective the way that ACEs were, were described in the literature, but um, people with greater than eight uh, people with greater than five adverse uh, ACEs versus zero are eight times more likely to, ha to have lifetime substance use disorder, 10 times more likely to inject drugs. This isn't by accident. If we sit back and we look at our patients, we look at moms, we look at where they're, what, what the experiences they're, happening, they're having, um, this is part of that. So when we look at long-term outcomes, it frequently fails to account for many of these things. It doesn't account for the context. It doesn't account for um, many co-exposures. And so I'll give you an example. This is a study looking at achievement of infants diagnosed with neonatal absence syndrome. It's published in 2017. It's a large cohort uh, from, from Australia, and pretty cool. They merged medical data with achievement data. So they had testing uh, for kids when they went to third, fifth, and seventh grade. So how did they account for the differences between other children or these matched controls? You see this big difference between achievement. I mean, in this graph, you see that infants that, that had NAS were far lower in terms of achievement all the way up to seventh grade than other children and matched controls. Well, they matched at the time of birth on gestational age, socioeconomic status defined broadly, and sex, and that's it. You can see how that's not adequate. When we talk about the context of where our families are during pregnancy at the time of birth, much less for the next 15 years. How can we really say that this is what, it's true, we can look at any, any baby in our NICU and say, uh, you, you know, follow them because they have various stressors and look at their achievement and call it lower, but compared to whom? Um, I think that's really challenging. All right. As we finish up, I'm going to talk about policy change and what's happened more, more recently. And um, you, you can't talk about that with talking about changes to the foster care system and the child welfare system. This is another place where we've seen uh, racial bias play out. There's a, a pretty famous study uh, in the New England Journal in the 1990s um, from, I believe it's Polk County, uh, Florida, where they kept, it's Ira Chasnoff, kept, uh, looked at left behind urine samples and tested them. They found identical drug use patterns among white women and black women, but found a tenfold higher rate of referral to child welfare among black women. So here's what we've seen over time. This is the number of infants in the US in the foster care system. And uh, from 2011 to 2017, we see states growing, and you see a disproportion, and again, looking very similar to the maps that I've shown you before. In 2017, 4.1% of West Virginia infants were in the foster care system, 4.1%. Striking. If we look nationally, 
10,000 more kids are in, the fo in foster care, 10,000 more infants, not kids, just infants are in the foster care system. So what has happened as, an, as, as a response to this? There's a series of reports that happened from Reuters in 2015 that followed infants diagnosed with neonatal absence syndrome and um, showed that, uh, that they died. And they died from various causes, sometimes sleep-related deaths. Um, but this led to congressional hearings about you know, what were we doing? What was, how are we making sure infants are safe when they go home? Um, so in 2016, the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act was passed, and it modified the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act um, to address the needs of the infant, but also think about mom. How can we engage the caregiver? It's not just about keeping the infant safe, but making sure we address the needs of, of mom and uh, to make states monitor plans. So it's important, but of course what happened with this is what does a plan of safe care look like? The legislation is pretty unclear. How are we gonna pay for this? There was no additional money for this. So not surprisingly, the Government Accountability Office released a report about two years ago now saying that states are mostly confused and very variable in what they're doing. And you see reports from other magazine, other, other groups like Governing, uh, when it was still around, uh, did some work on this too. The states are confused. And I can tell you that like my state child welfare ag uh, state agency is also working through this, trying hard to fix this, but are unclear about what, what the language means exactly. In this space, we've seen a lot of additional improvement and some that and, and folks that are in the child welfare space uh, have been advocating for many, many years that's happening now. One of those is the Families First Prevention Services and Treatment Act. It allows states to use child welfare dollars for prevention, including connecting mom to treatment during pregnancy. That's extraordinary. So taking the block grant dollars and really working upstream. During one of the almost many government shutdowns in 2018, there was also some funds from one of the budget acts to pay for this. And then we saw the Support Act passed. The Support Act actually has a lot of language uh, that, that does a lot for, for pregnant women and infants. Is it comprehensive? No, but it does address trauma. It does, talk, it does have a good chunk about plans of safe care. And it's far more specific about what a plan of safe care should look like and, uh, and who should be involved. And here's an example of the things that are in there. So, if you really have a plan of safe care, if you're really concerned about how mom's doing and how do we keep the diet intact where it's, where it's, where it's possible and keeping the infant safe, then you need to engage these folks. Child welfare agency, state substance use treatment agency, early care education, Medicaid, public health, residential treatment, the judicial system, home visitation, Title V, and early intervention. So pretty easy to do all this. States are still struggling with this and implementing this. And I think this is part of where public health really has a role. Uh, where pediatricians really have a role. How can we be helpful with how states implement this? Because sometimes we end up with state policy that can also be pretty darn harmful. And I'm gonna talk to you about an example from my state, Tennessee. Tennessee had, uh, had a law on the books called the Safe Harbor Act in 2013 that ensured a family-oriented drug abuse or drug dependency treatment would be available for pregnant women, and if they engaged in treatment by the 20th week of pregnancy, that uh, there would be no prosecution, the infant wouldn't be taken away because of substance use. But then we had Public Chapter 820, also known the fetal assault law, that a woman could be charged with a misdemeanor if she illegally used narcotics during pregnancy and if the infant was harmed as a result, including development drug withdrawal. This law was on the books for two years. Some really uh, actually astute public health leaders and the Tennessee Department of Health saw this going through and uh, argued for a, uh, and it was going, argued for a sunset provision. So at sunset in two years, it came up in committee and died in committee. But while it was there, what we saw, if you, if you just extrapolate that around 10% of, uh, of infants are exposed to substances, it's about 8,000 infants in Tennessee a year. So do we really arrest 8,000 pregnant women a year? No, we arrested a couple hundred and disproportionately in minority communities as well. When we see, again, in this space, disproportionately babies with NAS are Caucasian. This law sunset, and again, just stories of women uh, driving to other states. Uh, there's one woman who testified when this came up who delivered in her car uh, because she was afraid about being arrested. The stories of, of uh, the police being on labor and delivery. Um, we don't want to see this happen again. We'll talk about what that. So around this time, our committee and the American Academy of Pediatrics said, well, okay, well, states are trying to do something. So when I like spoke to my state legislators, many of them were trying to do something positive and needed to just understand how this was harmful. Um, so we published a policy statement called a, a public health approach to um, oh, substance use and pregnancy, focusing on states should focus on prevention, including improving access to long-acting reversible contraception, universal screening for substance use and connection to treatment, um, 
comprehensive access to addiction treatment, which you certainly have here, but many places don't, and improved child welfare funding. And child welfare funding has really been flat for many years. But of course, this came up again. So this was up again this past year uh, in the state of Tennessee. We've seen it pop up in Missouri, North Carolina, other states. Um, and the language itself, I mean, look at how this is written. Tennessee bill, would, this is after the law sunset. Tennessee bill would impose assault charges if the baby is born addicted after mom uses drugs. And I haven't said this directly yet, but babies can't be born addicted, right? Addiction is a behavior. I've never encountered a newborn who's like, I'm gonna go ask this nurse for another dose of morphine, right? Uh, that's not how it happens. Babies can have withdrawal, they can have be, you know, be more drug dependent, pick your language, but they can't be addicted. And oftentimes this term is really used to stigmatize and it really does change public perception. I mean, think about the, the, the headlines we saw before. Miracle 15 pound baby versus baby born addicted. How do you respond emotionally to that? The bill when this came up again actually had the language born addicted written in it. So it does have an impact. The way we frame this in terms of like the politics of neonatal abstinence syndrome is really important. It drives stigma or it prevents stigma. So what can we do about this instead of laws like this? This also died. It actually died because, uh, because everyone was aware of it now again and uh, communities rose up and said, hey, this is a bad idea. It really takes a comprehensive approach. I mean, you can see in this space, a lot of focus has been on the opioid crisis, but not a lot on pregnant women and infants. One of my hopes is that the opioid crisis will lead to po positive change to many of our fractured maternal child health systems. Everything in maternal child health is siloed. Be that Medicaid, if you know one Medicaid program, you know one Medicaid program, right? Or Title V that's variable, look at WIC at the county level. Many, thing from, many things from maternal child health go federal, state, county, and it's very siloed. My hope is that we see some coordination, we see innovation, we see investment in the space. But I'm a pediatrician, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. So what does that look like? You know, look, it, it begins pre-pregnancy. You know, we still use a lot of opioids. And look, we need to use opioids appropriately. I mean, right now we're seeing supply side changes where we're seeing people, you know, grandma's been on opioids for 30 years and she's being tapered off and miserable. That's a bad idea. But we need to make sure for acute conditions that we're, we're prescribing appropriately. Access to treatment well before pregnancy to help inter, interconception care. Um, also improving access to LARC. Pregnancy, we have a long way to go. I mean, look, again, like pregnant women are less likely to get into treatment, and if they have insurance, if they don't have 250 bucks to pay for their first appointment, they're less likely to get in. Um, evaluating some of the comorbidities, including uh, hepatitis C, and beginning planning with mom early. I mean, we have engaged moms, so I've had the experience, and this is not uncommon, right? Being in the unit, and I have a mom who's been, who's in recovery, has been on methadone for years here, a mom who is chaotic and is not, you know, not engaged in treatment at all but she happens to have a, a urine drug test that, that is normal, even though the infant's obviously exposed because of the clinical signs. Child welfare system focuses so much on the urine drug screen that the mom who's been in recovery for years and years and years has so much attention. And the mom over here who needs help is getting no attention because she happens to have, we really need to begin to change the way we do this. And then looking forward, how do we support infants as they go through development, school, beyond? Okay. So to conclude, pregnant women have been affected substantially by the opioid crisis, and our approaches really do need to be tailored. General approaches for the general population don't work for pregnant women and infants always, and oftentimes pregnant women and infants are forgotten when we think about treat when we think about um, when we think about solutions. Improving outcomes begins well before birth, including uh, thinking about access to treatment for pregnant women. This isn't about drug use. I mean, it's really easy to just talk about drug use as a problem, but drug use is a symptom of a larger context of trauma, lack of economic opportunity, that permeates many communities, both urban and rural throughout the United States. And we have to address many of those issues as well. Data on long-term outcomes are really underpowered, kind of inconsistent, um, and I think we should be careful with that. But I, I do hope, again, that the opioid crisis can lead as a, be a vehicle to address many of these issues. A lot of folks to thank, including multiple collaborators at multiple different institutions, um, as well as our funders, the National Institute on Drug Use, uh, Drug Abuse, um, and, and others. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, that was wonderful.
Um, you didn't touch at all on syphilis. Yeah. And the twin epidemics of drug use and syphilis. Here in Maryland, we've got um, a syphilis epidemic that's being fueled in part, if not mostly, by um, drug use. Um, we're not seeing so much meth, but we are seeing a lot of injection drug use. And the women who are being identified, women of reproductive age, huge increases in syphilis. I mean, nationally, what, what we're seeing um, mirrors what's going on at the national level. So increases in female syphilis, increases in congenital syphilis, including um, syphilitic stillbirth. Um, the women report injection drug use. They're reporting sex work or commercial transactional sex. Um, they're not willing to name their sex partners because of the fear of sexual trauma and possibly losing um, their business. Um, they are flying intentionally below the radar when it comes to seeking and obtaining health care. So they're not going in for prenatal care. They're not going in for primary care. Where they are going is urgent care centers and emergency departments um, for wound care, abdominal pain because they're in preterm labor. So. Is that, thinking about policy and prevention, is there anything that can be done that, you know, because you, you mentioned hep C, but what about the other, you know, HIV and syphilis and kind of the whole interplay? It's a, it's a global problem, I think, that we struggle with nationwide. And I just wondered if you had thought about, yeah. you know, well, thanks for such an easy Healthcare. question. Um, the, uh, just kidding. So we have seen nationally an increase uh, in syphilis that we haven't seen for a while. I mean, I think this is, again, one of the other issues that we don't, I mean, I, clinically, we don't see it a lot in Nashville right now, but that doesn't mean we won't. Uh, I think it's it's all part of the broader issue. I mean, you guys are doing a lot in terms of uh, reaching out in the community to try to to do addiction treatment in unconventional ways, like right? treating in churches, treating elsewhere. I think that may be part of the solution, developing a trust and fostering uh, fostering that early on. I think that's sort of a community community. But I, in terms of like how do we begin to, uh, that's, I mean, it, hepatitis C is easy to treat compared to that, right? I mean, in terms of the complications that we worry about for both mom and baby, it's far more severe for syphilis, right? Congenital syphilis. So I. That's it's hard. I, I certainly don't have the uh, the solution. I think we see worrisome trends with HIV too. Again, not in my community, but in many, including in West Virginia, where we see we do know some things like needle exchange programs that seem to help. That doesn't necessarily get to your syphilis question, but you know it does go to addressing. And, and again, how do you create policies that address a lot of the underlying issues of trauma, lack of economic opportunity? I think this is where engagement in the community is so important, building one-on-one -on -one trust. I mean, I've heard uh, Sam Quinone say things like, you know, the antidote for the opioid crisis is not uh, naloxone, it's community. I think, that, I think that's true, but I think it's community and connection. So much of this is people feeling like they don't matter, and that sounds really touchy-feely, but it's true. Um, you know, connecting with people one-on-one -on -one is something that's hard to do with policy, but I think it is possible with community outreach. Yeah, of course. I agree um, and wanted to thank you for a really wonderful talk and for your body of work in general. Um, one thing that I appreciate is your um, constantly talking about the connection between a mom and the baby. And um, I think what we push against a, a bit in public health is this idea of the innocent baby and bad drug using mom. And I feel, I sense, I'm under the impression that that's tied up with um, the abortion politics narrative sometimes. Um, so I've hit roadblocks in terms of trying to put in uh, family planning services in substance use disorder treatment clinics mm -hmm. or substance use disorder uh, treatment in family planning clinics and um, because of punitive policies that stem from this notion of, you know, bad mom, innocent baby. So um, I guess I just wonder if you could talk more about your thinking and how do we change um, the, the public narrative around um, moms and babies and their connections? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think um, there are so many layers to this, including um, 
advocates from both sides for, for kids and, and, and pregnant women uh, who are advocating for a population we have to advocate for, but sometimes advocating not in concert, but against each other. And I think part of it is figuring out this conversation together because look, healthy moms have healthy babies. It's not rocket science, right? If we keep mom healthy, we'll have a healthy baby. The other part of this is that unhealthy babies become that mom later, right? If we look at sort of a lifetime of trauma that may happen, so what are we doing to sort of intervene with the dyad in that space? I think some of it is, so I have seen change in the way that we talk about this, even in the last five years. I think our talking about this, having this conversation about why the dyad is important is, is part of it. I think part of the way we talk about it, the part of the language that we use, it's important. I, look, I think many people are afraid to talk about contraception. Uh, even being with uh, you know opioid policy folks, if I just talk about birth con if I talk birth control or like larks, it's like what are you talking about? So I think we have to do a better job of understanding, like communicating to policy folks that access to lark is important. I mean that's that is in, in a time where we're seeing things rolled back in terms of block grants to states. I think it's just important and. Where we've seen our unique partners, like I'm thinking about like Raul Gupta and, and West Virginia, able to sort of engage the state to think about paying for incentivizing hospitals to place larks and things like that. So I think it's, 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 each space is important, um, but I think part of it is the larger narrative and comparison, like how we talk about this. And, you know, it's hard to sort of make people feel empathy, uh, but I think we can sort of convey what we see and talk about the diet together because it is impossible to separate. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I wanted to learn more about in your care model, you talked about as part of post-discharge creating positive interactions with the child welfare system. And yeah. I think as you alluded to, this is an incredibly punitive system, sometimes even punishing moms for engaging in opioid agonist treatment. Yes. And so I was wondering if you've found that you've been able to create positive interactions and how you've been able to do that and what kind of, kind of education and needs to be done kind of to educate the child welfare system on kind of what treatment is, what addiction is, you know, all these things. I think the first step is engaging in the conversation. So, you know, when we sort of see it play out at the worker level, it can be problematic, right? So engaging state leaders, engaging the local folks about, hey, well, let's talk about this. Like what is, when you think about how the system is set up. It was set up to care for infants that have been physically abused and sexually abused. And this is very different, right? We're talking about how do we keep the diet intact? So engaging directly with conversations, I think, is really important. Educating workers about what is neonatal abstinence syndrome, how do we do this, is the drug test really the most important thing? There are models, like, look, we are, we're working hard uh, back and forth, like being willing to, are we perfect? No, not at all. But I think that sort of back and forth conversation is important. There are great models around the United States. So there is the National Center, I'm always messing this up, National Center for Substance Exposed Infants and Child Welfare. That, that is a resource to states as they're working on developing this. They have a website, it's SAMHSA funded. Um, good examples from Vermont, uh, from other places that have crafted plans of safe care or even plans of supportive care, uh, because some folks would view plans of safe care as we'll be able to keep the baby infant safe from the mom in treatment, for example. So there are models there. Are we perfect? No, we're working really hard to sort of copy what other people have done. Um, and hopefully we're making some progress. States have to do plans of safe care. We can be engaged in how this looks like so that we don't see what's happened in many communities with plans of safe care is that it's just casted a wider net to get more reporting of infants as opposed to targeting what's needed. So having that conversation with your state child welfare leaders about, hey, does it really make sense? And do you have the resources to engage every mom who's in recovery? Is that really what you want to be doing? Most of them would acknowledge no. Um, hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, I know cutting costs obviously is kind of legislatively and politically alluring. Um, <laughs> that's kind of one of the, the number one prompts for this kind of thing. And especially with NAS, a lot of the discussion is around cost, healthcare costs, you know, state costs, all of that. Um, and I think in direct response to that, a lot of times, you know, researchers, uh, legislators are looking at ways to cut length of stay um, or length of treatment. Um, is, is there anything that you can say about kind of what in your experience would be maybe a better metric um, for quality yeah. of care for NAS treatment? 
Yeah, so we've tried to sort of reframe a little bit, even like population wide. So like, you know, now uh, Title V had NAS is one of their metrics, but not all NAS is created equally. So if where you can merge uh, data on how many, how, what at the community level, what proportion of NAS are moms in treatment? Trying to change those measures from a population wide. I also think what we are trying to do with one of our programs is instead of looking at length of stay, looking in the first year, at what proportion of days were mom and baby together? Which is interesting because it, it includes length of stay, but it also includes child welfare metrics. Um, I think we, one of the things that I think we really need in this space is uh, a national convener. We need NIH, other folks to say, what, do, what is the standard definition? What are the top three research needs? And how are we gonna measure this? Because you know, it's, it's not length of treatment either. It's not like, so I don't have a great answer. Is it some patient reported outcomes? Yes. I think we need to start delving into that space more. Um, because the other thing of this too is we send home infants. We, you know, what happens? We send home infants earlier and then they go home and they're, you know, we had this conversation this week, right? They go home and the infant is incredibly difficult to, to care for and then mom relapses, you know? So where are we, where are we thinking about the diet in terms of outcomes? I don't have, a, I don't have an answer to that, but I think we need some space. We need some, some, some conveners for that. Hi. Um, so you emphasized multiple times throughout the course of your presentation how important uh, community intervention and community focus is with regard to coming up to some sort of solution. I was wondering, to your knowledge, do you know of any community-based intervention strategies that have been implemented mm. that bring moms together of substance use disorder around that same gestational period or at you know uh, similar birthing times that would perhaps... Um, foster community within these groups of women, disseminate information in a way that is um, not discriminatory, mm -hmm. gives them a safe space in order to talk through their, uh, their issues, both with providers and also with uh, social workers or, you know, whatever these stakeholders look like with these moms together. Uh, so the closest thing I can think of is, is, is peer recovery coaching, right? But that is not the same as what we're talking about. Like peer recovery coaching is not going to fix syphilis in East Baltimore. Being actually in the community with probably with community health workers we're talking about that. I think so. The answer is no. I'm not aware of a really fantastic model to sort of bring folks in uh, at the at the very ground level. I think there are strategies to and really not great evidence to be honest in, in pregnant women in, in peer recovery. But we're seeing that kind of emerge. How can we support people as they go through that together? Um, but I, I don't have, in terms of evidence-based, I don't have a lot of um, really great models. Other folks in the audience might, I don't. Hi, thanks, thanks for the talk. Um, so I was just wondering, um, in the context of, you know, this is like a particularly trying time for um, immigrants in the United States, um, and it just struck me when you showed the image of, you know, children being taken away from the mother, as you explained. I was wondering, I know Tennessee has a large immigrant population, and if there has been any, um, you know, seen effect of kind of fear or, um, in seeking treatment uh, or, you know, anything related to, to those populations. We've seen it more generally with fear with like public charge, things like that. There's fear in, in communities, some of which we're doing, some of our partners actually are doing some qualitative work in various communities right now where we're looking at um, educational outcomes in immigrant communities in Tennessee. So we've seen fear broadly. We've seen that in terms of kids getting into care because that's where we've looked. Um, I'm not aware of, and I don't know that honestly in sort of recent immigrant populations that this like opioid use disorder is a big problem. But I think broadly what we've seen is is policies, the language we've seen over the last few years certainly keeps people out of the office. Like we've seen that in our clinics at Vanderbilt where you you have fear of like you may have one uh, one infant, one child who is a legal citizen in the U.S. and one who's not, and then neither of them come because they're afraid. We see that play out all the time in our clinics. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I wanted to touch back to the perinatal transmission of hepatitis C, and yeah. certainly clinically, that's something we've seen a lot more exposure here recently. And as you brought up the the testing algorithms, 
are not great at capturing everyone. And there was a publication about a year ago that highlighted this failure to fully screen exposed infants because of the recommendation to wait until 18 months. And this whole phrase of, if earlier diagnosis is desired, could consider PCR-based testing. There's been some recommendation by some ID experts that perhaps we should move to a nucleic acid test yes. um, in the immediate neonatal period just to avoid that loss to follow-up. Do you have any thoughts about making that a more formal recommendation, or is it something that you would just consider instituting at a hospital level if, if that's something of interest? I think one of the barriers to appropriate treatment is the lack of really clear guidance. Whether you go to Red Book or whether you go, there are, uh, there are so many different types. So I think that it has to be the RNA testing early. I, from what I'm told, because I'm not, I'm not a PEDS ID doc. That really early, it, it may be falsely reassuring, though. You or it may not be a good. So like two months, four months, like that sort of follow up to me seems far more realistic. Um, so again, in terms of like, I'm hoping that we see some more concrete guidelines come out because I think it's a barrier. Great, thanks. Yeah. Stephen, thank you. I have I have a question. Sure. So going back to the question about. Um, how we get people to see this as moms and babies together and not just babies. My question is whether we're focusing too much on neonatal absence syndrome. And you know, you have that website where you can look at it a gazillion different ways. <laughs> that gets people to think of neonatal absence syndrome as an outcome that's meaningful. But a good percentage of neonatal absence syndrome, the moms are in treatment just like we want them to be, and the dyad is doing fine. So if you're focusing people so much on the outcome of neonatal abstinence syndrome, then are you actually reinforcing the baby focus that we don't want? Yeah. Would a better outcome measure be, you know, um, non, you know, uh, uh, abstinence syndrome where the mother has untreated opioid use disorder or something just all together different? But I'm I'm concerned that that even well intentioned efforts make people think that the actual outcome that everybody is out there trying to prevent is neonatal absence syndrome when in fact people may be recommending that people go on treatment and which could lead to a little neonatal absence syndrome after birth but the baby and the mom are doing better like you said so i think that's really important feedback and it's feedback we actually get from you know some of our studies right so we get like you know you're looking at for example actually feedback we got from that study that we published earlier this year I think one of the challenges is that, you know, what is the outcome to measure and how can we measure it without linked data? And so, you know, for, uh, for many of our work, so I would, I would challenge some of the notion that pregnant women are getting into treatment because I think that's not happening. I think it's happening in some communities. I think it's not happening in many, particularly rural communities. To the point where, to the extent where we can sort of use neonatal absence syndrome as a proxy for substance use that is being under addressed in communities, I still think there's value there. I do think we have to be careful, but I worry that if we move away completely from studying neonatal abstinence syndrome, mm -hmm. then we're not going to do the research at all because yeah, it's not the outcome studying, time. but using that as sort of this core outcome that stands alone. Yeah, you know? no, I can. So I completely agree yeah. with that. That we sort of focus in on. So what what we've done, for example, is looking at like in our own population is looking at all opioid exposed infants. But it, to your broader point. This isn't about neonatal absence syndrome. This should be about the issues that we were talking about, about all substance use, about trauma, about economic opportunity. I think the question is about developing the metrics that make this, that we can sort of begin to study and move the conversation forward. Um, so, I mean, I think that's our challenge. So we've talked about this in multiple, I mean, we had a study recently looking at punitive measures uh, targeting pregnant women and, uh, and neonatal absence syndrome. And some of the feedback, even the commentary was like, you're stigmatizing this further by talking about neonatal absence syndrome, even though we were studying punitive policies. Talking, so I think it's complex. I'm not at the place where I think talking about neonatal absence, absence syndrome itself, or studying it itself is harmful, but I, I do think it has to be nuanced and we need to develop better methods and, and outcomes to be able to study better. I appreciate that. I mean, in some of the conversations we've had with state leaders, we've encouraged them to see it as where the mom is not in treatment yeah. is a better outcome than in you know some places it's 30 40 50 percent of the neonatal, neonatal absence syndrome yes. is linked to treatment and you have um a syndrome in this is another other questions a re related question yeah. where um neonatal units this is more of a clinical question uh are focused on the mom as having caused the problem even if yes. the mom has done exactly the right thing and gone into treatment and you know sometimes um the mom feels so bad about having caused the few days of discomfort for the baby that the, the mom's convinced that she really needs to go off of treatment and yes. it adds to the stigma of treatment and then the next thing you know 
you know, the risk of relapse is high. Yeah, I and mean, we see this with public health surveillance too, like why are we surveilling neonatal absence syndrome? If we were willing to think about public health interventions, we'd be studying the proportion of pregnant women not in treatment, for example. I mean, I have seen like United, like Optum has developed some metrics where they have linked data mm -hmm. to look at the proportion of NAS not into treatment. Yeah. I, th I think it is part of the messaging we give. Uh, and I think the question is how do we push forward the science with the really fractured data systems that we have? And then the clinical, so then the clinical follow-up question would be, what do you do in the neonatal intensive care unit so that you're not you know, the effect isn't to put a huge guilt trip on the mom who's actually done the, the right thing. Yeah, so I think training our nursing staff, everyone with trauma-informed care, which becomes mm -hmm. like this bucket black box of like, what is trauma-informed care? But some of it is like having that conversation about what treatment is. Like when I go to national meetings and I talk about to other neonatologists about and nurses about this, I mean, the common comment I get from folks is like, are these horrible doctors that are prescribing these women buprenorphine. But talking about the benefits of treatment, educating people about the experiences people have in a standardized way, that's important. Part of the Vermont Oxford curriculum that we created was a site visit. It was a virtual site visit to um, First Square at, at, in Vancouver, where they just talk about families' experience, how, to do, how they do birth. I think it's a structured education kind of to, to build out what's going on, why this is different. Should there be quality measures for neonatal care that like, is mom in treatment? Of course. You know, that should be an outcome of neonatal care. Yeah. Um, in addition to how many days the baby spent in the yeah, hospital. Yeah, and to hospital systems, right? Holding hospital systems accountable, what they do. Obstetric care. Neonatal care, I mean. So the question was obstetric care, neonatal care. I mean neonatal care. Like, at the, in other words... The, the problem is none of this is linked, right? Parents. So we still, we in data systems everywhere, we view it as as not... But from a health system, right, that should be the outcome. Yeah, I mean, I, I've discharge. met with neonatal nurses, and I say, well, like, what percentage of the babies go home to families where the mom's in treatment, they're like, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. How would I possibly know that? Why would I, I possibly care? And it's like, that may be the single most important thing for the child's developmental yeah. future. Can I have a comment on that discussion? Uh, so I'm one of the neonatologists here, and I would say that even though a fair number of our moms are in treatment, at least the ones that we encounter in the NICU, and keep in mind that's a slightly biased population because of severity or prematurity, but a lot of the women who might have been in treatment are either not fully compliant with treatment or there's other substance abuse. So even though they might be in a methadone program, they might use cocaine during pregnancy or there might be a relapse and they might use heroin. So it, it's not just this yes or no, are you in treatment? So some of it is impacted by that. And I would say a lot of our babies don't go home with their mothers. Some of them do. Um, and I think especially the babies who are able to stay in the newborn nursery and do a, a different model of care, that's a more favorable outcome. But frequently we are taking care of babies where it's not that the woman is in treatment and compliant, at least in this setting. I would say like the other thing is like thinking about, so the way we set up, the way we measure is we understand opioid exposure. We know who's in treatment, who's not. We know the outcomes that are different. And it, about one in, about less than 10% of our infants don't go home with mom, even in Tennessee. Yeah, I mean, the, those sorts of things could be thought of as outcomes of neonatal care. And, and you, you know, every place may start at a different baseline, but then you can move in the right direction if you're thinking that your outcome is about the social environment of the child, not just the, you know, whether what the score is of the baby. So I mean, I think part of this is like this, and I don't, not to sort of like harp on that, but it's part of this conversation we're having, like, right? It's the, what's the right outcome? What's the population outcome? How do we balance like mom's needs, the baby's needs? How do we look at how this works in, in the in real world NICU life too? We have, these are part of the conversations we need to be having about, you know, where do we meet in the middle in terms of like, what are the outcomes we should be measuring? And you're right, that ha that's not happening in cases nationally. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you for your talk. I was wondering, as your list of care providers, um, I didn't notice mental health, um, clinical mental health therapists or chaplains as a part of that list. Um, what do you think about? Yes, that's resources, to be honest, right? So we have. Um, we, you know, we don't have the, the resources to, to be to be honest about it. But yeah, I, absolutely. So what I'm hoping in our next iteration, we are waiting to hear about funding. We're going to have more direct um, access to mental health providers, uh, thinking about mom's needs more broadly, too, and even infectious needs, things like that, to where we're going to be more comprehensive in our approach. And look, there are programs around like CAP, uh, for example, that do that uh, here at Hopkins uh, and other programs around the country that do. But I mean, strong shout out to the Center for Addiction and Pregnancy, which, uh, like right there, yeah. 
that really sort of is the you know model for how we should be doing this. Well, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Patrick for the talk.